to Moments with Mary Ann. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with two very special guests. Our first guest today is Barbara Abercrombie, and she's here to share with us her new book, The Language of Loss, Poetry and Prose for Grieving and Celebrating the Love of Your Life. Now, Barbara has published over 15 books. Two of her books were listed on Poets and Writers Magazine's Best Writing Books of the Year list. She's received the Outstanding Instructor and Distinguished Instructor Awards from UCLA's Extension, where she teaches creative writing. So let's welcome to the show, Barbara Abercrombie. Thank you, Marianne. I'm happy to be here. You know, what an honor it is to have you here and to share your book with us. Why did you decide now is the time to write this book? Well, I I wrote it for myself, really, in the beginning, because it was the kind of book I needed to read. My husband died five and a half years ago, and I always get through bad stuff in life by reading, and I, I couldn't find a a book that was devoted to uh, with poetry and and memoir excerpts devoted to losing a partner or a spouse. There are some wonderful collections of poetry about grieving and death and and getting through it, but um, there wasn't there wasn't. Interestingly enough, there were more books about or more poetry and more memoir about losing parents or a sibling or friends than losing uh, your romantic partner. So I put this together for myself, really, to read. And So why was having the poetry aspect to this so important for you? I... I Poetry cuts to the chase. And when my husband died, and I think anybody who's gone through the loss of a, the love of their life might might feel this way too, is that I, I couldn't concentrate. My concentration was gone. So I, um, I, I really wanted to read poetry, the depth of poetry, the shortness of poetry. Um, and that for about... The first six months after he died, I couldn't concentrate on reading a book. And then I started reading memoir. And um, I I reread Joan Didion's uh, uh, Year of Magical Thinking again. And I found uh, lots of different memoirs to read. And uh, and then I was able to I, I was able to concentrate. So I started this. I think it was about it was about two years after he died. Um, and I thought, this is this is the book I want to read. And, and if I want to read it, perhaps other people want to read it. And also, also give and also excuse me, also give to people because it's so hard to know what to say to somebody when when they're when they're grieving. Uh, we don't our language is very um, I think our language is. Uh, it's hard to find the right words to say. So I think there's a lot of poets who knew what the words might be. Well, I'm so sorry for your loss. And, and I would agree with you because there's so many different beliefs and thoughts and feelings around the loss or losing, you know, your partner. You know, I think a lot of times people just kind of struggle with what to say or even how to feel. Right. Right. And it's, it's the, and that I quote um, Madeline Lengel in the book too, who says that people are afraid it might happen to them. You know, they don't, people are just, in our culture, particularly, I think, um, grief embarrasses us uh, because we don't have, we don't know what to say or how to fix it. And I think we're also a culture of wanting to fix things and um, find, um, you know, find uh, closure to anything that's that's uh, that's uncomfortable or sad or unhappy, and or that you can't control, and you can't control grief. Um, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> we don't have we don't have the language for it. So, when someone you know is in grief. Why is it important for them or helpful for them to read books about grief? 
I think because they, I can, and I can only really speak for myself, but I'm sure it's true of, of many of us. Um, you feel so terribly alone when you're grieving. You feel so isolated, even though in the beginning you're surrounded by people and the funeral and all that. But you feel terribly isolated. And you also feel you feel like you're losing your mind. You feel crazy. And, um, and I think to read about other people who have felt this way makes you feel like they're, you're not as crazy as you think you are. There are other that you, and that you're not alone. And what you're going through is absolutely natural. I think most people feel pretty isolated when they, you know, lose a loved one. And especially when you lose a, you know, love of your life and a, a partner it's just i think it's compounded then right because it's your your um you know it's your every moment of every day uh um your your life is basically totally 100 percent changed i think when your partner dies um and very often you have to move or um your your whole circle of friends can switch in a way. I felt so, so grateful because I teach and I write. So I I that was tremendously helpful to me. And what I did is at the time I was still living in our house, which was kind of large, and I I felt so lonely and I wanted um I, I needed company and I invited all my writer friends and my students to come to a potluck once a month at my house. And we called it the, uh, the lit salon. <clears throat> they'd come to the house and they'd bring food and wine and everybody would read from whatever they they were writing for five minutes. And, uh, it was such, it was the smartest thing I did, I think, right after my husband died. I did it, I started it about three, three months afterward. And, um, and it's, it was going on up until the pandemic, uh, and got bigger and bigger and, and really formed a real community for me. Oh, that's so impressive. And what a great idea too yeah. to be able to include other people in your space and being able to have those kind of connections, you know, when, yeah. when you know we're going through loss. Yeah. And they they were so darling. They're such dear I have such dear friends because then I moved into a very small apartment. I thought I'm still gonna do this. We'll just cram ourselves into here. And they all said, Oh, it's so much cozier here. It's lovely. And then I moved a uh, third time and I moved to Pasadena from the west side of Los Angeles and they we switched to a Sunday brunch because of the traffic and um and it just grew and grew. So we'll have about uh, up to over 30 people for each, for each meeting. And I can't wait to get back to it after this pandemic. I bet. It sounds yeah. like such a great, you know, coming together and that, mm-hmm. you know, people just need, they're craving for. And it's interesting because, you know, when I look back and just lost in my life and my friends' lives, you know, there's this period that we go through grief. And of course, we're grieving. It takes as long as it takes. And then there's also a period where there's like a celebration of life. How do you navigate between the two of those? Um, do you, you mean uh, the, the literal celebration of life, the, uh, the, 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 the ceremony or just. Sometimes it's, say? it's really more like just celebrating the life that they had lived. Right. I think that comes, that comes gradually and it depends the circumstances of the death, I think too. I mean, um, my husband had gone through a year of being terribly ill and it was a complicated family situation because we had a, f- a blended family. Um, but there does come a time where it, you, you do slowly switch from grief and pain into gratitude. And you think, I was so lucky to have known this love. And I, and the deeper of the love, of course, the deeper the grief, um, but I feel it, it took me, it took me two and a half years to, 
to start moving into the gratitude and feeling and feeling. And what happens, Marianne, what I found is that you will always miss this person. I will always miss my husband. I will always think, oh, I wish I could tell him this or, oh, I, I, I just would love to be with him. Um, and the missing will always be there, but the grieving does end. It ended for me. And it was, it, it's very subtle. And one day you realize, one day you realize you have a memory of grief instead of the grief itself. The missing is there, but missing and grief are two very different feelings I found. So when it gets to their celebration of their life, that's just something that we kind of live every day. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I look back and I, I, I'm letting go. You find that you you you're forgetting the 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 last weeks or the last year or years where that person was ill, um, and life was very difficult. Um, and uh, and you think you um, you start just remembering the happy parts. I don't mean to sound like Pollyanna, but I really I really remember. Ah, oh, just wonderful, you know, trips we took and conversations we had and family dinners. And there's a great deal of joy in my life from, from thinking about my husband now. So as people read your book, and I found your book to be very helpful because I could just pick a chapter, you know, turn a page and read, and I felt it brought inspiration at any point. Is that kind of how you intended people to use your book? Yes, yes. There's actually an arc to the book. And when I started it, I didn't I didn't realize it would have an arc. I wanted poems of abject grief because that's what I was feeling at the time. And then I realized, and I had a long talk with my age, agent about it, and um, you know, she said there there should there could be an arc here where you go from the abject grief, and that's the first that turns out to be the first third of the book, and then moving into just getting through it, just living your life, gritting your teeth, and being stubborn, and realizing you have no other choice. You get through it. And uh, that's the middle part of the book. And then the arc to, and I have a, I have a quote from Patty Smith uh, when she realized after her husband died that the pages of her life were turning. And that's, that's the third, that's the third part of the book where um, there's, there's, um, I'm looking at the book now, a different son is one, one of the poems and from Grace by Diane Ackerman, um, on the lawn of the memory, violets suddenly appear, each a sensation like a note, but without the dirge of loss, etc. Um, photo albums open their leaves with a calm that seems phenomenal. I love that line. I'm in door. I, I, Marianne, I have to tell you, I'm in love with everybody in this book. I'm in love with the content. I can say that because I only wrote three pages of it myself, but my the the poets that are in this book and the writers are just I am in love with them and it was such it was so much fun to put this book together finally because um, I could just sit around and read poetry all day and read memoirs and decide what to choose and it was that part was very easy and then I had to write find the permissions I had to get permissions for every single thing I used and uh, that was a whole that was a whole other job. But I got through it. I think I kept thinking this is worth it. This is worth it. That must have been such a journey. <laughs> and and yeah. when you were going through and deciding what, you know, who you were going to include in the book, was that just an of course, or is it was this something that just really spoke to your heart? It had to speak to my heart, and it also had to be applicable to losing your love, using the the love of your life. Um, So I had to, some of the poems I've excerpted, excuse me, some are excerpts and they were originally maybe for a parent or for a friend, but I would just do an excerpt that would apply to a spouse or a partner. Um, But you know, it was the most, I, I, and I don't know how I found, uh, you know, I look at all, you know, there's a huge amount of 
material in this book and it was all pleasure reading and, and discovering it and I and it's going on now I just read a book called Late Migrations uh, by Margaret Renkel and she has the most beautiful page about grief and I thought oh I, I just I want to use this but um, if there's another edition maybe I can get it in but the book is is what it is right now. What is another one of your favorite portions of the book that was included? Because there, I, I read through it and there are so many that I really appreciated and adored. Oh, you know, <clears throat> what I loved, and I'm looking it up for, by um, Barnes. Um, I loved some of the things, some in the, I'm just looking through very, very quickly and I can't. Linda passed in the five stages of grief. I abs- I adore everything in here, but I particularly love the ones that had um, had some dark humor in them too. And she writes about, you know, there are supposed to be those stages of, of grief that you go through and then you're, voila, you're done with grief or whatever, you get through it. Um, but she writes about how, um, you know, she's trying to get through the, the stages. And then at the end, she sees this big neon sign acceptance, but then she heads towards it and realizes that grief is a circular staircase. Um, and, uh, it's just, it's just got wonderful dark humor and, and, um, Julian Barnes also, uh, a number of the writers hate, hated the word past for death. And he, he did a little riff on how much he, he disliked that word. And then I have another, about two other writers who talked about that word. Then I have a poet, Alison Josephs, who defiantly uses the word past. And she said, in, in her poem, she says, you know, just get over it if you don't like the word. And so I love the juxtaposition of those two different ideas on language that are in the book. Um, but I, and, and Abigail Thomas is in it. I'm a great fan of, have you ever read Abigail Thomas? I had not until I read your book and oh, I was real impressed. I love it. her. She's written some of the most, she's written three of my favorite memoirs. And I was very excited because she gave me a, quote for the book that's lovely and it's on the on the jet on the front on the front cover um it was it was I had a wonderful time um communicating becoming pen pals actually with some of the poets and the writers because if I couldn't find their publisher and some of this was I did a lot of detective work uh you know, going Googling and looking up um, obscure little magazines that they were in. And, um, and then I, I so I, I had a, I have a correspondence with about, I don't know, maybe a third or fourth of the writers in the book that, uh, that was, that was very satisfying, very satisfying. And I was so thrilled to get Erica Jong's quote, because I so loved her book, Fear of Flying. And Richard Blanco, who was uh, Obama's inaugural uh, poet, gave me a quote, too. So it was an interesting project, is what I'm saying. You know, it came (laughs) out of, Marianne, it came out of um, such grief and such despair, and it turned into... Um, not only it really helped me through the project itself helped me through grief too i uh it it turned into to a wonderful experience and I love new world library who are my publishers uh publisher and um and it was it was enormously satisfying and it's dedicated to my husband and i just I just love to think how pleased he would he would he would have been with it. Has there been a spiritual belief that has carried you through the grief that you've had in losing your husband? Um, I, I'm hesitant. Yes. I, I, in the beginning, I think just the rituals, I'm not, um, you know, a weekly church goer, but I, I'm an Episcopalian and I love the rituals of my church. And he had a beautiful, beautiful uh, funeral uh, celebration of his life. And um, the rituals of my religion helped me through. Um, 
That's that's an interesting question. I go back and forth. I I think I think I came to believe that uh, love is never lost, um, and love love is so love is part of my spiritual belief. And um, uh, and again, the deeper the deeper the love, uh, the deeper the grief. But then you you come back to the love again, and love generates generates love i think if that makes any sense if i think so i think that makes a lot of sense what what do you want readers to take away from your book i for well, the idea that they're not alone mainly i think and that idea that their grief will turn into gratitude <clears throat> at some point um, that, um, you know, they might even, they might find love again, or if they don't find love, they'll find some kind of peace. But basically, I think it's the idea I read to know that I'm not alone. Whenever, whatever happens to me, I want to read books about it, not to figure, not, not necessarily self-help books. I want to read some writer who went through that that kind of an experience, and I want to know how how they got through it. And I also I teach memoir at UCLA now, and um, it, it's writing a memoir is very often about turning a a, a huge a huge mess in your life or a huge sadness in your life into a work of art and giving. I think I think I, you asked about spiritual things. I think as a writer, writers are are our mission or what it, you know, our, our, what we do in life is, um, and I, I think of it as a calling we give, it is our duty, our mission to give our experience to others and to help them through it, which sounds awfully goody two shoes. <laughs> I <don't mean laughs> well, I mean, if we look at it, we're really just kind of helping each other along. Right, who we- was it? Do this Ram journey Dass. of life, right? Right. Ram Dass said, we're all just walking each other home. <laughs> mm-hmm. For so sure. I do believe it. I, I love it when, when there's dark humor and all that too. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So Barbara, where can our listeners connect with you and learn more about your book, The Language of Loss, and be part of your community? Oh, what a nice question. I have a website, um, uh, barbaraabercrombie.com, and I'm on Facebook as Barbara Abercrombie, and I would love, I would love to have them get in touch, and I will respond. If I don't respond, it means I somehow didn't, didn't get their message, um, but I would, I would love to hear from, from your listeners. Well, Barbara, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Oh, Marianne, thank you. I've, I've really enjoyed this interview. Thank you for, for inviting me. Well, thank you, Barbara. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, The Language of Loss. The Language of Loss is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And of course, you can get it on Kindle. You can also find this book on the New World Library website. Again, if you like to connect with Barbara, you can at barbaraabercrombie.com for more information. Do you have a vision for what your life could be? You'll want to stay tuned for our next special guest, Robert Moss. He's here today to share with us his new book, Growing Big Dreams, Manifesting Your Heart's Desire Through 12 Secrets of the Imagination. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. We'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. 
teaching beyond conventional wisdom. Her work is described as life-changing. Visit judygoodman.com. That's judygoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special. When you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here is where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with our next special guest, Robert Moss, who's here to share with us his new book, Growing Big Dreams, Manifesting Your Heart's Desire Through 12 Secrets of the Imagination. Now, do you have a vision for your life, but you're not quite sure how to get there? Well, today's special guest is going to share with us how to do exactly that. Now, many of you know Robert. He's a best-selling author and the creator of School of Active Dreaming, an original synthesis of modern dreamwork and ancient shamanic and mystical practices. Robert leads popular workshops all over the world, including a three-year training for teachers of active dreaming and online courses for the Shift Network. So let's welcome to the show Robert Moss. Good to be dreaming with you, Marianne. Oh, I couldn't think of a better book to start dreaming with. (laughs) I have to ask you, Robert, like what inspired you to write this book? Well, it's a book we need right now, you know, because we've been through some hard times. We have hard times ahead of us again. And we need some relief. We need some resources. So one of the things to know right now, when more people are actually paying attention to dreams than I've noticed in all my previous life in our society, is we can do a few things in dreams which would be hard to do in ordinary reality. We can travel in our dreams without leaving home. Isn't that nice to think about? We can be as social as we like in our dreams. And dreams also put us in touch with deeper sources of wisdom and guidance and healing for life. You know, in your dreams, whether you know it or not at the moment, you get in touch with your purpose, you get in touch with the meaning of things, you meet wise ancestors, and you have adventures, and you go to places of healing, and you could learn to bring something back that can transform and energize your life. So it's a book we need right now. I've written many books about this kind of thing. I mean, I'm a dreamer, and I mean, I've written in different genres, but I've written many books about what is possible in dreaming, including bringing back parts of your vital energy that went missing, getting more of your soul in your body. But this is the one that is needed right now because it shows us how through our dreams and our use of imagination, we can find our way through and come out better. Well, I'm so glad you shared that with us. And this is such a great book. I loved reading it. It has so much great information. I'd love for you to share with our listeners what dreaming is, because I think a lot of times people get stuck on, well, I have to be asleep if I'm dreaming. I know that people think that if they think about dreams at all, and people are thinking about dreams more than they used to, they think, oh, it's passive. I lie down, I have a dream, dream has me, I'm asleep. Well, okay, yes, good things happen in sleep dreams, including dreams you don't want and did not ask for, which hold up a magic mirror to your current life, to your actions and attitudes, and help you get clarity on how you're behaving and how you should maybe practice some course correction. But dreaming for me is not fundamentally about what happens during sleep. Dreaming is fundamentally about waking up waking up to a deeper order of reality, waking up to resources and connections beyond ordinary perception. So we dream in our sleep. Sure, 
We can also lucid dream, whether or not we wake up inside our dreams for the fact that we're dreaming and call that a lucid dream, or whether we do it in that drifty state between sleep and awake, where I spend a lot of time and encourage other people to spend time, middle of the night, yet to go to the bathroom. You're lying in bed. If you stop kicking yourself because you're not asleep and just stay open to the images that rise and fall, that's a kind of dreaming that can be very creative. We can dream in a certain kind of meditation. We can dream in shamanic journey. We can dream in the world around us if we go out out into the street, prepared to receive signs and symbols and synchronicity as dreamlike messages from the universe. So there are many modes of dreaming. But for me, fundamentally, it's about wake up and dream, wake up to the fact that there's more going on in life than the ordinary mind generally understands. We have sources to wisdom and laughter and joy and energy, you know, when we do this dream stuff. I'll just note briefly, in ancient Egypt, where they did a lot of dreaming, the word for dream, which we transliterate as reswet, R-S-W-T, means literally an awakening. So there in ancient times is the understanding that to dream might be to wake up. It seems that in some ways we've, we're coming back to this old ancient knowledge that we've forgotten. I think we are in some ways. I mean, there are things that our very distant ancestors understood. They did a lot of dreaming. And when we were naked apes, go back before Egypt, you know, being hunted for breakfast by saber-toothed tigers and leathery raptors, how did we even stay alive? How was it possible to sleep? Well, you know, people dreamed. And in their dreams, they tuned into an intuitive radar, which showed them things happening across time and space and gave them a sort of vigilance ability. So this has been part of our survival radar since forever. And you might think, oh, we've got NASA, we've got NSA, we've got all this stuff. You know what? We still get ourselves into all sorts of terrible trouble. The dreaming puts us in touch with sources of intuition and creativity for life, which are invaluable. The fascinating thing, Marianne, is although you have to practice, practice, practice to get really good at it, we all have access to this material. It's thoroughly democratic with a small T in that sense. Everybody dreams, including the hard hit who says, I don't dream, but it's just saying I don't remember. We all have a way of getting in on this game, and it's a game well worth playing. Oh, without a doubt. And your book really is a roadmap for people to get there. And I love how you start your book off. I mean, it's one of the chapters you talk about dreams show you the secret wishes of your soul. And that I thought that was so profound. Well, it is profound, and I can't claim credit for the original phrase. What happened to me in midlife, half a lifetime ago now in the, in the 1980s, is I'd moved to a farm in upstate New York, and I started dreaming of earlier peoples who'd lived in that area. And one of my dreams, a lucid dream in the middle of the night, I find myself flying, which is fun. Some of you know what it feels like to fly in your dreams and feel good. I'm lucid. I'm, I'm aware that I'm dreaming. I'm having fun. And I'm called north, 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 and I'm called down to a cabin in the woods somewhere near Montreal, but there are no modern buildings or roads, and I'm with an ancient woman, I mean, an indigenous woman, and she's talking to me in a musical cadence language, which I do not understand. Well, that lucid dream was the start of a dialogue, which went on for a long time, it required me to do some work, it required me to identify and learn her language, which is an archaic form of the Mohawk Indian language, with some Huron mixed in because she was born Huron. She was a medicine woman of long ago. And she taught me what her people and her tradition understood, that the most important thing about dreams is they show you the secret wishes of your soul. And the task of decent people in a decent society is to gather around the dreamer, listen to the dream, help them identify what the soul is saying, what your deeper self is saying to you in the dream, and to take action to manifest that. Because as long as you're just operating on the surface of things, trying to fit in with calculations and schedules and grocery lists from the ego, you're not where you need to be, which is in touch with your heart's desires, in touch with the wishes of your soul. So that beautiful phrase from a native tradition, from an indigenous tradition, put me right in the sense that I felt it put me back where our ancestors, maybe all our ancestors of all our cultural traditions, uh, understood we need to be in a place where we are listening to a deeper source of wisdom than the ordinary mind. What a profound experience that must have been. Do you often find yourself going back there to kind of experience the same, you know, just the feelings that you had? Well, she calls me from time to time. I don't think about her all the time. I mean, I have many connections. We have many connections in our dreams. I mean, we really do. Uh, I think about what's been going on this week, which is completely different territory, European and Middle Eastern territory, basically. But uh, sometimes she'll call me, and sometimes it comes through an appearance in nature of a red-tailed hawk, because a hawk, this kind of hawk is what actually guided me to live on the land where I started dreaming of her. Sometimes it comes with the impression, the blurry impression initially in my space, 
but there's an animal there that is not one of my dogs or cats or critters that live with me. It's a white wolf. The white wolf appears, and I know that it's a dream figure, but it's almost palpable. I follow the white wolf, and I'm with her. So she's the mother of the wolf clan of her in ancient times of her people. So sometimes a wolf comes. Then I'm connected with her, and when I'm connected with her, I feel I'm on solid ground because she is one of those earth keepers. This is a phrase worth thinking about. One of those wise ones who stay, who've moved on from this world in terms of physical death, but watch over this world to try and keep us on track, to try and defend the earth and defend the peoples who live on the earth as long as they're following good values. So she contacts me from time to time, gives me a message, gives me a call. And this is one of the other things to know about dreaming. Dreaming will put you in touch with your authentic spiritual teachers and the traditions, the cultural and spiritual traditions you most need to know about. You may not have clarity on that until you dream it. I know in your book you talk about how the body believes in images. What do you mean by that? Well, medical science tells us the same thing, Marianne. Actually, if you have entertained an image or it's actually just a strong thought or feeling in your mind, your body, body will start responding as if it's a physical event. The body does not seem to make a difference between what's going on in your mind or your imagination or physical event. We learned about this early on through sports psychology. Sports psychologists working with Olympic skiers who needed to practice for that blur of going down a mountainside, not seeing what you're doing, had them sort of play um, movies in their mind of what it was like to to ski down a mountainside in an Olympic competition. And they noticed when they wired them up that their bodies were reacting, you know, in the EEG scans and so on, exactly as they would be doing if they were actually physically on the on the, the mountainside. Then in oncology, it was discovered that you give a cancer patient a good image, one they can believe in, or better still, help them to find the image for themselves, the body will start responding appropriately. So I've done a lot of work in this area, and one of the things that I encourage people to do in the book and in the workshops that I lead is develop your personal pharmacy of images that could help you. I'm not knocking aside anything good from medicine you can derive, but why not become your own healer to the extent that you can by seeing if you can come up with some imagery that will make you feel better, reduce your perception of pain, maybe encourage the, your immune system to boost itself. Where do you get those images? Well, you get them from happy life memories. You get them from programs offered to you. But the fact, great factory of images for healing the body is your dreams. It gives you images every night. And even if you don't like the images, you can work with those images in the direction of health. I also train people to go to places in the imagination which are places of healing, places where others have traveled. You, there are real worlds of imagination. And if you can gain access to them, you can go there and bring back things that will help your body to get well and to stay well. So this is an open secret. It's waiting for everybody. You can do far more than you might have realized to keep yourself well and to stay well by giving more space to the power of imagery. There's so much there that I want to unpack. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you talk about just this imaginary world. And for a lot of people, and I love how in your book you talk about how this is real. And for a lot of people, you know, that travel there, they, I think sometimes they're like, yeah, I, I, I get this, it, you know, but there might be a little bit of confusion on, okay, well, which one is real? The reality we're in or the imaginary, you know, reality that's there? Well, it's not all, it's not either or, you see. This is the interesting thing. The physical world is real. There are other worlds that are no less real, and arguably, in the view of some mystical traditions or shamanic traditions, for example, they might be more real. It might be that there is a realm of imagination. Not simply imaginary, but imaginal, imaginal in the sense that it's a realm of true imagination from which what manifests in this physical world is projected. Ideas are grown there. Things take shape there before they take shape in the physical world. That's actually a popular idea in mystical and shamanic traditions, that everything that manifests in this world starts somewhere else. It's even there in quantum physics. You know, events take place when an observer looks at something, then a definite event jumps out of a stew, a quantum soup of possibilities. So, you know, uh, I know from my life as a conscious dreamer and traveler in these realms that there are other orders of reality that are also real. And I would argue that perhaps they're no less real than the, the reality in which I can stub my foot or need a drink of water in order to 
to continue a conversation. Uh, these include, by the way, parallel worlds, where you and I, Marianne, are leading parallel lives for what right now, ranging from the slightly different parallel life where we're not doing your show, to another parallel life where you never had a show and I never became a dream teacher, to something else. If this sounds crazy, well, then modern physics is crazy too. Because in physics, there's a popular model of understanding these days called the many, many worlds hypothesis or the many interactive worlds hypothesis, which posits that at this moment, we're living in one of uncountable parallel universes where we're doing different things. Our universe splits all the time. This is what a lot of physicists think is reality, that vision of things. What does it mean for you and me? Well, if you follow your dreams, and I write about this in the book, you might discover that you know it's interesting to look in at that parallel self of you who stayed with that partner or did a different job or you know made another fundamental life cho choice and see how they're doing. And when you look in on that, it's very interesting. Sometimes you think, oh, good, thank goodness I never stayed with that person. Sometimes you think, well, I feel a little bit of regret, but it's nice to know that somewhere else we're still together. Sometimes you notice, oh, gosh, I have certain skills and connections in that parallel life I don't have right now. Maybe I can reach in there and bring something through. This is this is my, my common practice in my teaching and in my in, in my personal work to look in on these parallel lives in parallel realities and see, hey, what can I borrow from Robert over there? Or what can I learn from his situation? And how can I help other people to understand you may be more than you've realized? I mean, there might be more of you to bring together in your present life. You can bring tools and gifts and resources from some of these parallel realities and live with them right now and be stronger and better and braver as a result. I think that's so empowering for people to hear that they can, you know, utilize these resources in other parallel dimensions that will help them in this one. Is that something that's really difficult to do or does it just take practice like everything else? Well, it's said that to get excellent at every, anything, you have to have 10,000 hours of practice, right? I think that might be correct. Dreamers uh, have an advantage. We, we have a leg up because, first of all, you can do a lot of this in your sleep, around your sleep, put in a lot of your work, your, your practice time in your sleep. And then, of course, if you're going to become a conscious dreamer and look at the world around you as a set of dream symbols and signs and read synchronicity, then, then you can do a lot of a job by just walking the dog or you know, going out the street or getting the groceries, whatever you're able to do these days. So, yeah, it takes practice. You know, you don't become an Olympic skier just because you can fall down a mountainside. Even I can fall down a mountainside. That doesn't make me an Olympic skier. It takes practice. To become a world-class streamer takes practice also. But you know what? We all have the ability to tap into this to a greater or lesser extent, and it can do a world of good and bring, a, bring, bring excitement and adventure and healing and energy into any life. Well, Robert, I know that you are one of the renowned experts in this field. Have you ever, when you're doing the research for this book, did you ever come across anything as far as research that surprised you? Um, did something surprise me in relation to this book? Well, the research, the essential new research I did for this book was to collect a lot of dreams. I mean, I'm a dream teacher. I, I used to teach all over the world physically. Now I teach all over the world online. I can read 400 fresh dream reports every day from people all over the place if I want to. And sometimes I read that many when I'm doing specific research. So early this year, uh, between New Year's Day and Epiphany, which is January the 6th, I asked people to send me their dream reports so we could see how we were dreaming into the new year. And I looked at these and I looked at what people were dreaming at the start of the year in terms of thinking about the year ahead. What is surprising to me is that very few of those dreams contain specific glimpses of the COVID pandemic. Very few people seemed in any, seemed in any explicit way to be dreaming into a situation where they'd be under lockdown or under all this threat and all this pressure. There are plenty of political dreams about the craziness of the political system. There are dreams about specific things in life from a specific angle that you'd need to think about. There are plenty of dreams that forecast some aspect of the future, but I did not notice a tidal wave of dreams uh, forecasting quite what the pandemic, quite what the COVID-19 situation was going to do to all of us. So it's slightly surprising to me to find amongst, let's say, 400 dream reports I read over those, those days, that there's so little clear information about that, something missing, maybe because in, on some level, people understood that we're going to get through it. On the other hand, still speaking about being a little bit surprised, one thing that surprised me most over the year that followed as I continued my research into how people are dreaming today 
is how many more people proportionally are dreaming about what happens after death this year than in previous years. It's always interested people. Number one reason why people have not shared dreams before tend to start talking about them. they dreamed of grandma or dad who's died and they show up and they want to understand, is this for real? What should they do about it? This year, and of course we understand it because death is all around us and people are being shunted off without rituals of farewell or even being with the family. Uh, we need to understand death. We need to understand what waits for those of us who go beyond the gates of death. We need to know how, how to help people approaching that situation and maybe help them if they're lost and confused on the other side. So I noticed early on in the year and throughout the year, lots more people are reporting dreams of the afterlife and the departed. The interesting thing is that by and large, they feel positive about these dreams. Yes, the weight of death and grief and loss is terrible. In many, in many lives today, but many people at the same time feel buoyed up and suckered and supported by the idea that in their dreams they're discovering there's life beyond life. Those who die are go, maybe going to a good place, not necessarily a better place, but a good place, and that continuing communication is possible. So that's not altogether surprising, except that the volume of it, the quantity of dreams involving death and what happens after death, has increased a lot this year. Do you find that we're in this place where people are more open to talking about dreams now than ever before, just as a society or consciousness is more aware for that? Yes, yes. I mean, we, we've had a sort of psychic or psychological pandemic in our society for a very long time. And that is the dream drought, the persistent dream drought, the fact that so many people in our society have been bereft of dreams. They literally don't remember their dreams. And sometimes they feel sad because they, they know they're missing something. And sometimes they suspect it's because they see things in their dreams they'd rather not think about it. And sometimes it's quite simply because they haven't been encouraged to make time or space in their lives to share dreams that haven't known anyone who can talk, about, talk to them about their dreams in an effective, rational, helpful way. That's all changing. This year, and maybe it's because people have been spending more time at home. Maybe it's because people are reaching for sources and resources beyond the obvious. Uh, maybe it's because people are thinking about death and larger values and what is life all about anyway. A lot more people, from, from, from my point of view, are now willing not only to remember dreams, but want to talk about them, want people who can guide them on the meaning of their dreams and what to do with them. And when they're still not remembering dreams, are hungry, I mean, really hungry, Marianne, for access to this material. I'm approached every day by people who are hungry. I don't remember my dreams. Can you help me? I know I've been missing out on the movies. I know I've been missing out on a fundamental part of my life. I hear from friends who remember. I need to remember. So it's both that people have more dreams they're willing to share and they're more open about sharing them and they need guidance and that people get it, that there's a whole dimension of life and meaning that they've been missing out on and they want to get in on that. So it makes me hopeful that we might be on our way to rebirthing some kind of dreaming culture where people take dreams seriously and share them wisely and give each other encouragement and help each other to take action to embody the healing and energy of dreams because at the end of the day that's what we've got to do it's not enough to yak about a dream and then boil it down to some desiccated sterile bit of analysis we have to bring something from our dreams that supports life that gives us juice and joy and energy and maybe leads to a creative project or some healing I know you also in your book, you talk about personal symbols or themes. Why is it important for us to identify those? Well, because it's such fun. I mean, <laughs> who, who isn't interested? You know, I mean, why do people look at tarot or the Ennead or anything else and, and are fascinated by symbols? Uh, it's interesting to look at what, you know, the snake in your dreams means as opposed to what the snake in someone else's dreams means. And this is one of the interesting phenomena about dreams. On the one hand, we hear someone else's dream title or dream summary. We recognize something of ourselves in it. I'd like five cents to every time someone has said to me, have you ever dreamed you're back in school or back in college and you've got to take a test? What would that mean? Well, okay, we, we recognize that. I mean, anybody who remembers dreams has had that dream. I've had it many times, particularly earlier in life. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it probably generally means life is a school and you're facing a test. But the point I'm trying to make is on the one hand, the theme sounds familiar even universally. On the other hand, your personal spin on it, your personal twist is always individual and unique. Okay, you're back in school, but which school is it? What test 
specifically are you facing in your life? So the, the, the great beauty of dreaming is, on the one hand, it's absolutely individual. This is your own experience. On the other hand, the themes, the symbolic themes that arise are universal and put you in touch with lots of other people. So you can both have the joy and the, the learning of looking at your individual experience and have the sense of connection, of human connection, that comes from recognizing a theme that is widely known and widely recognized. I know that is so much fun, isn't it? I love the examples that you give and just how you have some information in your book that talks about that. I was like, ooh, so much fun to to dive into that and and see what your personal theme is. And you mentioned something that I would love to share because everything's about connection. And I know in your book, you talk about that we're a magnet. What is that like? Why do you say that we're a magnet? Well, this is one of the truths of our condition, you know. I mean, our, our thoughts, our energy, our feelings attract or repel, you know, events, people, even 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 incidents in the physical universe. I mean, this is the law of attraction, which has sometimes been simplified to a ridiculous degree by the New Age people. But it, it's, it's a law of life. There is a law of attraction. We attract or repel according to who we are and what we're carrying. It's like this. Your attitude is always going ahead of you. It's shaping what will happen around the next corner. So pay attention to your attitude. You know, if you're going around with a gloomy, miserable, self-defeating attitude, the world's going to give you every possible way to support that attitude about life. I'm afraid that's how it is, which doesn't mean you just have to sort of con yourself that everything is hunky-dory and fine. But it does mean you need to pay attention and check yourself, monitor yourself, in terms of what energy, what thoughts, what feelings you are carrying and thereby projecting, because the universe is going to say yes to whatever you think and feel with any depth of feeling. So one of the games I tell people to play is, hey, slow down, stop, check your inner soundtrack. What are you saying to yourself right now without maybe being aware of it until you pause and ask yourself, what song is playing in your mind is one way of coming out. What pause? What song is playing in your mind? And if you don't like the soundtrack, the song or the the, the thought you're repeating to yourself, see if you can change it. I mean, I might pause myself walking the dog and say, my knees don't work too well anymore. Then I'll check that and I'll say, well, it's just mileage, isn't it, Robert? Isn't it great you can still get out and about and walk your dog in the park despite everything? So I change my inner soundtrack, not by doing some new age game and saying, I am Superman, I'm master of the universe, but by, just by giving it a spin so I can approach the day and humorous fact fashion rather than telling myself you know i'm an old guy whose knees don't work too well you know and what an empowering place to come from though because when you look at that if we could all shift that inner dialogue to more positive dialogue i mean how important is that it's hugely important i mean the, the, the world as i said whatever you think or feel the world is going to say yes this is simply the case I and mean, sometimes you can say yes in a way which is shockingly in your face so pay attention you are magnetic you attract or repel things according to the thoughts and images and feelings you are carrying and this works out to an extraordinary extent may i tell you a story about this you have time for a story oh yes love a story well, you know, when I was editing Growing Big Dreams, uh, most of which was written before the pandemic was upon us, uh, the main change I had to make was to put certain stories in the past tense, because I used to fly all the time. I'd, I'd fly every week. I flew to Europe seven times a year, blah, blah, blah. And the way I would survive these long plane trips was I'd get stories from people and I'd write the stories in great fun. Well, anyway, in the midst of all this, I noticed that sometimes the best stories I was collecting in all my travels around the world by airplane uh, were really good because something had gone wrong. You know, if nothing goes wrong, you don't necessarily have a good story. So some of my best stories were mediated by screw-ups. So one day I'm feeling a bit tired. I just want to get home quickly. And I say to the universe as I enter the airport, Oakland Airport in California, I don't need a new story today. I'm fine. <laughs> so I sit down in Australia and it's lunchtime. I sit down at the bar. I order a beer. And a ruddy-faced guy next to me looks at me and he says, you look like a guy who'd enjoy a story. I said, well, yes, I do like stories. <laughs> he starts telling, I've asked for no story, but I have a story magnet. People love telling me their stories. So he starts telling me a story. He's a retired cop, East Bay, San Francisco detective, already interesting. He says, Robert, I've been waiting all week to tell the story to someone who could hear it. Oh, tell me, tell me, tell me your story. He says, well, I was walking in a graveyard in Oregon. I look at him. Yeah, I've never been there before. He said, I just wanted to walk. And I'm thinking about a girl I loved and could never have 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And I look down and there's a headstone and there's her complete name, three-barreled name, and says she died last summer. I think this can't be her. And I call and it is her. 
What do you think happened? Well, we could talk about this all day. I said, it's a great story. So the reason I'm telling the story right now is I'm a magnet for stories. I live by stories. I'm a storyteller. I love to hear people learn to tell their stories so well people will listen to them. There's great power in that. And because I'm a story magnet, even on the day I didn't want a story, I thought, I'm still brought a story. I mean, that's magnetism. (laughs) <laughs> that is magnetism <laughs> and such a compelling story too, because you listen to that you're like, Hmm, how did that all come together? But you know, you're so in, you know, just knowledgeable about the workings of the dream state. I'm sure you kind of are looking at it from a totally different perspective than most people. Well, I'm always interested in uh, opportunity, and uh, that means that I am open. I mean, what you receive in this way has a great deal to do with whether you're open and available. I mean, I live by synchronicity. I'm not traveling much now, so my opportunity to observe synchronicity is usually confined to the logo on that truck or the license plate on that car or a snatch of conversation or what the birds are saying in the park because I'm not traveling the world the way that I did before the pandemic. But even so, with my eyes wide open and all my senses alive, I'm going to receive whatever the world gives me. And I'm talking about external reality in kind of walking meditation as a message of some kind. So I'm available. And if it's a message of a certain kind, I'm going to take it as something that I might act upon. It might be actionable. This is how you get good at navigating by synchronicity. And that's the dreamer's way of operating with your eyes wide open. So let me say this very clearly. Dream is not just about what happens during sleep, and it's not just about shamanic journey or lucid dreaming or whatever. It's approaching the world itself as a living dream, full of symbols, full of signs, full of messages, and learning to read those messages and act upon them and to be available to them to to them to begin with. Well, I know your book covers 12 secrets that help people with dreams. And I'm so glad that you've written this book. It's such a great resource. My goodness, Robert, where can our listeners connect with you, be part of your community and learn more about growing big dreams? Well, my website is mossdreams.com, M-O-S-S, dreams, plural, dot com. I teach a lot of online courses. I'm generally always teaching some online course, video courses now for the Shift Network. I teach other online courses as well. In a normal year, if we ever have a normal year again, you'll find me all over the world, map leading in-person things. I've written many books. Growing Big Dreams is the most recent. In some ways, I think it's the most important and the most timely right now. So check out mossdreams.com. You know, I have a blog. I have articles. I have Facebook pages, and I have a burning desire to help you grow a big dream for life and live it and tell it so well it wants to take root in the world. Well, Robert, thank you so much for being a guest on the show today. Thank you, Marianne. Well, thank you, Robert. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Growing Big Dreams, Manifesting Your Heart's Desire Through 12 Secrets of the Imagination. Growing Big Dreams is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And of course, you can get it at newworldlibrary.com. The book's also available on Kindle, so you can download it and start reading today. Again, if you like to connect with Robert and learn more about his programs and his books, you can at mossdreams.com for more information. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guests and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Marianne airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. 
Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.